This is Ubisoft. This is Ubisoft. Ubisoft. Explore our worlds. Meet the devs. See the games. Join us. Hi everyone, I'm Neelam Kumar and I'm very excited to be co-hosting the first Ubisoft Forward with the talented Yusuf Magid. Today's show is all about getting up close and in-depth with all the exciting games we have in production here at Ubisoft. I'm Yusuf, but there's no time to waste. So let's head straight for the streets of futuristic London and see what the hackers of DeadSec are getting into. Illegal paintings spreading subversive and hostile messaging over the last few weeks across London are not the work of several people, as was originally believed, but the work of an individual. The criminal, suspected to have links with the terrorist group, is marked as a recommend not to approach the individual. First, they came for the foreigners, and I did not speak out, because I was not a foreigner. Then, they came for the protesters, and I did not speak out, because I was not a protester. Then they came for the journalists, and I did not speak out, because I was not a journalist. And then they came for street artists, and I did not speak out, because I am not a street artist. left to speak for me. Welcome to the resistance. There's a welcome gift for our new members. But the disappearance of the criminal. You could have told me it was a bloody costume party. Try it off. The new key suspect has been identified as David Ford, a 43-year-old London taxi driver. He has no criminal record, but is currently believed to be a terrorist. People have been asked not to approach him. The authorities advise all residents. I'm Clint Hawking. Clint has been a longtime creative force here at Ubisoft, and now he's bringing this vision to Watch Dogs Legion. Um, so yeah, what we just saw was an amazing short film by the director Alberto Mielgo 
that uh, was inspired by Watch Dogs Legion and looks at, at the game and the universe and the characters through his incredible uh, artistic vision and visual style. The city needs a resistance. Like the film, Watch Dogs Legion tells the story of ordinary heroes setting aside their differences in order to come together as a collective and to fight for a positive change. You can literally recruit and play anyone who you see in the open world. You profile people that are interesting to you, you help them with their problem, you play their origin mission. Just help me get some closure and I'll do whatever you want. Sounds like a dead sec problem. Leave it to us. And that's how you recruit them into your team. And then they become the heroes of the game and, and the stars of your story. And what are you doing in my flat? You with Albion? Please, think more underground. You with Albion? I'm tickled, but think more underground. What, dead sick? Yeah, right, and I'm Che Guevara. You're done. And they make the story not only, you know, unique to them, but unique to you as the player and, and personal to you because they're, you know, heroes that you've chosen and invested in. What would I say to fans? I guess I'd say, you know, uh, take care of yourselves, stay safe. Welcome to the resistance. Ah, London town. A modern metropolis built on history and prosperity. Only took 12,000 years to build it up and one night to tear it all down. Oh my God. Listen up. Get all your units to move in and lock down the city. With London under attack by a mysterious terrorist, the government turns to a private military company called Albion to keep everyone safe. What could possibly go wrong? Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Nigel Cass, CEO of Albion. He's kindly stepped up to establish order. Understand this. I will not allow anyone, not even myself, to jeopardize this. He will stop at nothing to permanently control the city. London will be the first city in the world to be made truly safe. Nigel's not the only opportunist who's taken a liking to this fair city. Meet Mary Kelly, head of the most powerful crime syndicate in London. Be sure and spread the word. She and her goons are using the dark web to sell everything from party pills to people. This microchip is scary, I know, but I've got to keep tracks on my merchandise, don't I? You made me a slave. You do not want to ruffle her feathers. With the city out on its ass, it now falls on you to build a resistance and take back London. All right, everyone. Faces on, guns out. Any of the brave Londoners you see walking the streets can be recruited into your team. Like him. Her. Or even her. Everyone could become your next secret weapon. <laughs> In our first mission, we need to get some dirt on Nigel Cass, and that means breaking into Albion headquarters inside the Tower of London. All the hardy souls you see here are people we have recruited from the streets of London. They all have unique abilities, and you're free to tackle this mission with whoever you like. Dear God, my eyes. Bradley. Zip up, get to work, and let's never talk about this again. Like everyone in DedSec, Arthur can hack pretty much whatever. But as a construction worker, he has a particular set of tools that make him handy. He can even call his own cargo drone. Perfect for gate crashing when you're not invited. And who needs a regular old gun when you have a bloody nail gun? Call me this soidoid shit boy. Jesus Christ, what is that thing? Perhaps we could approach this mission differently. If you'd rather keep your distance, we've got you covered. Amy is a drone expert. What have we here? A real tech connoisseur. Hate spiders, but love this one. 
What an adorable creepy crawler. Here we are. Let's class the place up. A drone expert does have the unique ability to summon their own drone. This little darling is fast and stealthy. She aims, she fires, she hits. I'm reading incoming drones. She can also hack enemy drones, turning the tide in her favour. And if you are not into direct confrontation, there are more ways than one to get the job done. Recruiting an Albion officer like Brielle here might be challenging, but it'll get you inside restricted Albion areas. Don't mind me, just doing recon for a bunch of insurgents. However, do anything suspicious and she'll probably wind up with a bullet in the back of her head. You've been approved for entry. We're missing the human element here. I can get the defense minister on the line right now. Well, if you feel you must. Criminals running our streets, illegals threatening our families, the police commissioner himself, assassinated by terrorists. Well, that seems to be enough evidence. Next up, we're crashing Mary Kelly's organ farming operation and putting a stop to it. That's good. The buyers expect high quality stuff. And we need a hard nut for this. Impairing our frontal lobe again, are we? Bags. Don't disturb me in my natural habitat. Say hello to Mickey. The man lives for his team. That put another air on my chest. And doesn't mind getting his hands dirty. <laughs> he does have a slight drinking problem, though. And he's passed out. Ah, oh, well, we'll come back to him. You know what? Let's go with someone a bit more professional. <laughs> it's almost crass to call him a hitman. Some might even call him an artist. Here's the bastard responsible. Ah, <sighs> done and dusted. Not bad, not bad if I do say so, innit? Not everyone in London is a legendary assassin or a super spy, but everyone can be a hero. So get out there, find the best recruits, and build your resistance. It's time to take back London. Plunging the player into a living, breathing city, teeming with unique locales and characters, has always been a central pillar of the Watch Dogs series. So what goes into building those worlds? Here's Amanda Mutt to tell us more. My name's Amanda Mutt. I'm a level artist on Watch Dogs Legion at Ubisoft Toronto. Being a level artist, I think, is the coolest job in video games because we do get the freedom to, to kind of like pick and choose what little details we want to depict. And we get ample opportunities to tell the stories that we want to tell in the spaces that we're assigned to. I have the capacity to hide things and, you know, like small little Easter eggs. In AC Unity, there was a boat somewhere in the world that was covered in cats. And then it happened again in Watch Dogs 2. And there may or may not be something in London that is a boat filled with cats in some capacity. So. 
I was fortunate enough to go to E3 last year. Some of the people that I was showing our demo to were from London. So no matter where I dropped them in the city, they would go, oh my God, this feels like Camden. This, you know, this feels like Southwark. This feels like Westminster. When people are talking about some detail that I've put into the world and they're excited about it, like that feels so good as somebody who, you know, builds these worlds with care. I love it. <laughs>And now some news for Brawlhalla fans. In just a few weeks, you'll be able to battle it out with your favorite legends on iOS and Android devices. Three, two, one, brawl! Whether you need a Tom Clancy action fix on the go, or want to dive back into one of the most beloved fantasy franchises in gaming, we've got you covered. Chain is down. Request air support. Target northeast rooftop. Roger. Inbound. Danger close. I need an EMP deployed now. EMP imminent. Get back in your cell! Take this. Don't make me regret this. Speaking of Tom Clancy, it's been five years since Rainbow Six Siege first launched, and the community has never been stronger. In celebration of this milestone, Ubisoft Montreal has put together a special video to thank all of the amazing players and developers that have helped Siege become the game it is today. In December 2015, a small team released Rainbow Six Siege. a game built on a strong vision, 
creativity, competitiveness, and team play. For the player, the 1st of December is a beginning, but for us too. We have to engage immediately and say to the player, this game is installed, you can also install it, and we will be there. That original vision was quickly adopted by our passionate community, propelling it to a whole new level. This is such a special moment, and being at one year anniversary of Rainbow Six now, game being uh, stronger than ever, uh, more players today than we had in the past, it means uh, the world to us. But we also had our share of challenges. Um, health that touches upon subjects like matchmaking, connectivity, all those aspects are absolutely critical to the experience of the player. Through it all, we're always driven by you, our community, and together, we grow stronger. There is no sequel plan, and we're here for the next 10 years, so expect more Rainbow Six in your life for quite some time. Tous les succès, c'est vraiment le résultat de autant de nous que de vous. Ce jeu, il est autant le vôtre qu'il est le nôtre, nous, l'équipe de développement. Now 60 million players strong, we're just getting started. From the devs that build the game to the community that plays it, thank you. If you haven't tried it yet, dive into our new Operation Steel Wave update available now and take Ace and Malusi out for a spin. A few days ago, we introduced y'all to a brand new multiplayer shooter. Now, it's time to venture into the hyperscape. in the hyperscape. That's not supposed to be there. Well, let me get you all up to speed, okay? About 30 years ago, everything that we feared about our future started to come true. We made some good decisions. Order. We made some bad decisions. Actually, we made a lot of bad decisions. So, here we are. Ten billion souls living in the crush of the megacities. But the people at Prisma <laughs> changed everything. They gave everyone a way out. The Hyperscape. In the Hyperscape, the biggest draw by far is Crown Rush. This is where anyone can become someone. change your life. But strange things have been happening lately. Rumors of people getting hurt. Users disappearing from the real world. A darker secret lies at the heart of Hyperscape. And we have to find it. Some of us are searching for a way up. Some of us for a way out, and for others, a new way all together. That's what brings us to the edge of the future, to the hyperscape. 
I'm JC, Creative Director on Hyperscape. JC's work on Far Cry Primal and multiple Prince of Persia titles has established him as a top creative here at Ubisoft. For me, what's exciting is uh, we started uh, building it from scratch. Uh, seeing it grow, uh, adding ideas is really cool. Hello, contender. Welcome to the Hyperscape. The game takes place in 2054. It's in a future where humanity has grown a little darker. One of the, the companies there, they are launching what's called the Hyperscape, which is a virtual world and the internet of the future. It's the place where everything converges. Uh, within the virtual world, there is a battle royale that takes place in the virtual city of Neo Arcadia. Then we also introduce a lot of new things. You get the opportunity to do parkour on the rooftops, to go into interiors where it's much more narrow, much more stressful. Uh, you get to go to the landmarks where there's more uh, opportunities to get cool items, but also more players, so it's a risk-reward kind of deal. We introduce the notion of hacks, special abilities that you can pick up on the fly to adapt your tactics. With hacks, you can do things like uh, teleport yourself, uh, you can wrap yourself into a ball and uh, bounce around the battlefield. So a lot of abilities that let you have fun, that are toys that you can play with. And finally, it's made as a spectacle, so all the viewers will be able to interact with the game on different levels through the Twitch extension. So every few minutes, there's going to be a vote, and viewers will be able to decide what effect they want to affect the whole battle. So things like changing the gravity, uh, infinite ammo, or stuff like that. So players, while this happens, really have to adapt to all kinds of stuff that is happening. So for me, it's really exciting because right now, as we speak, we are launching the open beta, and so it's going to be available for uh, free to play for all PC players worldwide. And I really want to thank all the players, all the streamers, and all the viewers who participated in Tech Test and who will participate in the open beta. Here's a short glimpse of what you can expect. Watch and learn how it's done. Perfecto. Showtime. Mine. <laughs> Let's show them what I'm made of. Go time. <laughs> Watch closely. Here we go. The digital world of the hyperscape gave our artists and developers incredible freedom when it came to designing characters. Production manager Anna Maria Muska is going to take us behind the scenes of character design. My name is Anna Maria Muska. I'm the production manager for characters and weapons on Hyperscape. We have paid an exceptional amount of detail to our characters. We switch different outfits, different fashion statements, different tattoos, different materials until we see them as real individuals as real people. So the second you pick a character, you see them in game, you understand what their motivations are and what drives them and what challenges them. This was the first lineup of characters. This is our default base, but even starting from the hair down, everything has been meticulously thought of. Would this person actually like this type of outfit? Would this person enjoy the type of tattoos that we're putting on them? Will they actually like to be in this body? Each season, we plan to produce new outfits for these characters. So we're hoping some of our players are going to see the effort and maybe even correlate some of the accessories to what's going to happen in the game. We're very excited to see it in people's hands. As we move into the next generation of gaming, Ubisoft has been working closely with console makers to take advantage of all the extraordinary capabilities these new consoles will offer. 
Now we have a special guest to tell us a little more. Hey everyone, Phil Spencer from Xbox. With Watch Dogs Legion, Ubisoft is supporting smart delivery. So you will get the absolute best version of the game on any version of Xbox you're playing on. On Series X, you'll get to take advantage of the amazing work the team has done with DirectX ray tracing to create an absolutely immersive version of London like you've never seen before. Ubisoft has a unique ability to create immersive worlds, setting a new bar that continues to drive our industry forward. I'm a huge fan of Assassin's Creed. I love the time I've spent exploring the world in Assassin's Creed Odyssey. And I can't wait for you to see the gameplay from Assassin's Creed Valhalla that's coming up now. All right, we know you've been waiting to hear more about this game since it was announced back in April. And now it's time for a deep dive into the world of Vikings. My name is Julien Laferriere and I'm the producer of Assassin's Creed Valhalla. So a couple of weeks ago, we announced Assassin's Creed Valhalla and the reaction from the fans was just amazing. The time period of Vikings is really, really inspiring. When we did our research, we found that, you know, there were not mindless barbarians. Vikings were actually farmers trying to find new lands for them to settle. And so they had really human motivations. So for us to have this opportunity to tell kind of the real story about Vikings and kind of separate ourselves from the myths and the folklore is really something that drove us to, to make this game. The team went to Norway and England to take the same roads that the Vikings did to really experience what it meant to be a Viking at that time. And then leaving Norway, which is barren but majestic, and just coming by boat in England and see those rolling green hills full of sheep, full of life, is just this moment that most likely the Vikings felt as well. You need to see this land of opportunity. And this is exactly the feeling we want players to experience in this game. It is a personal adventure, you know? It is the story of Eivor, a Viking chieftain, Eivor is uh, either a male or a female. You decide when you start the game. They will have to leave Norway to settle in England because you just can't live in Norway anymore. There's too much political pressure, no resources available. Obviously in England, it's full of Anglo-Saxons and other people, and they don't really want you there. So you will have to fight your way there to kind of build your own settlement and see your clan prosper. Vikings were brutal warriors. Shields! And the fact that they were mastering a lot of weapons coming from the medieval times really inspired us to kind of revamp the fight system. To leverage the brutality and the intensity of Viking combat. Vikings were not only fighting face to face, they were masters of stealth and deception when needed. They used basically any sort of tactics they could use to win the battle. So we want to portray the full range of combat that you can imagine coming from the Vikings. We are very happy to finally be able to show you the game we've all been working on. So please enjoy this deep dive into Assassin's Creed Valhalla. In Assassin's Creed Valhalla, you will relive the epic saga of the Viking invasion of England. You play as Eivor, a Viking from Norway, who will lead his or her battle-hardened warriors across the North Sea to the British Isles. Eivor is driven by an ambitious goal, to build a thriving Norse settlement in a hostile land. For the good of our clan, it is time we go a Viking. Today we raid 
that tomorrow we may build. England is a dark age tangle of broken kingdoms and warring dynasties, a land of opportunity and riches. As you prowl England's rivers by longship, you may raid locations you spot from the shoreline. Ground your ship and blow your horn to lead your raiding crew into battle. Your crew will assist you in all your raids, fighting enemies, battering down doors, and stealing cargo too heavy for one set of arms. Whatever riches and resources you pillage may be used to develop your settlement, giving you access to useful services, better tools, and new settlers. At the heart of your settlement is the Alliance map. It will serve as a record of the allies you have made, and a guide for future opportunities. The Viking Age was a time of warriors and legends. In Valhalla, you will find the largest variety of enemies ever assembled in an Assassin's Creed game. Every archetype offers a unique challenge. Some will coordinate with their allies for special attacks, while others will use nearby objects to their advantage, including the bodies of fallen warriors. To face these attacks, you must find and exploit your opponent's weaknesses to gain the upper hand. Take the fight to your foes with a host of brutal new combat abilities. Snare them with a Viking harpoon. Pummel them with throwing axes. Incapacitate them with the new stun system to keep them at a distance. Or finish them off. Dual wield any two weapons you wish to unleash a deadly combination of attacks. Customize your fighting style as you see fit and become a legendary Viking warrior. All combinations of weapons are available to dual wield, including two shields. Not all situations call for violence. In this new land, a Viking must find a way to adapt. As Eivor is not welcome in England, you may need to outsmart your enemies, avoiding unwanted attention in towns and bustling cities. Use Eivor's hood and cloak to blend with crowds and slip past watchful eyes, an unseen hunter among the people. From capital cities and villages to the dense forests and rolling hills of England, exploration is vital to keeping yourself sharp. You must feed off the land if you hope to endure. Hunt and forage to replenish your health and fortify your equipment. Search pagan temples and Roman ruins for new activities and challenges to strengthen yourself and your settlement. The more you explore, the more of England's secrets you will reveal. Ravens, show no mercy! But as you push deeper into England, the enemy will push back. In a series of climactic moments, Assassin's Creed Valhalla will feature massive assaults in which you will lead Eivor's army into battle against heavily guarded Saxon fortresses. Today, we will reclaim her. Today we fight for your land, and tomorrow we rebuild! For East Anglia. Assassin's Creed Valhalla will transport you to wondrous and haunted lands, inspired by Norse myths and England's pagan roots. It will challenge and surprise Thank you, with unforgettable characters, thrilling triumphs and tragic losses, giving you the chance live your own Viking saga.
9th century England is truly unlike anything the franchise has seen before. Assassin's Creed Valhalla will release this holiday season on Xbox Series X, PlayStation 5, Xbox One, PS4, PC, and Stadia. We're close to wrapping up today, but before we go, our CEO, Eve Guimo, is here to share a few words. I hope you will have enjoyed what you have seen today and that you will love playing these games. I am proud of our teams for delivering an ambitious, broad and creative lineup of games. And we haven't shown you everything yet. In fact, we have a lot more to come. So you will have another Ubisoft forward to reveal even more about our upcoming games. But before ending this show, we have one more thing to share with you. It's beautiful, Migo. Perfect, but useless. I have something for you, Diego. Give me your hands. Papa, no. I... The grenade is simple. It has four basic parts. The shell, which contains the explosive, the fuse, the handle, and of course, the pin. What are you doing? Breathe, Diego. Breathe. The pin simply holds the handle in place. It is only when you let go that this grenade goes boom. Follow me. Now. I am El Presidente, which means that someday you will be El Presidente. And our people, they do not know how to be happy. They are torn apart by opinions, noise, indecision, strangled by their own freedoms. And even if you have love in your heart, even if you want what's best for them, if you only want to save them from themselves, they will hate you, Diego. Everything you say, do, believe, 
will be wrong. They will answer you with screams. Call you evil. A monster. And give you this. So you tell me, are you evil? And with that, we're wrapping up our first Ubisoft Forward. Today, we've seen the next generation of Assassin's Creed, the birth of a resistance in Watch Dogs Legion, the cyber chaos of Hyperscape, and the epic reveal of Far Cry's newest installment, along with so much more. Remember, we'll be back later this year with another Ubisoft Forward filled with tons of game news and updates. Thanks for joining us. Hey everyone, welcome to the Ubisoft Forward post show. My name is Yusuf McGeed and this is Assassin's Creed Valhalla. We're gonna take a deep dive into about 30 minutes of gameplay and we're joined by a very special guest here. Hey everyone, uh, this is Philippe Bergeron, uh, otherwise known as Fizz. I am the quest director on Assassin's Creed Valhalla. So Fizz, we're setting up here for what looks like an epic encounter. Tell us exactly what's going on here. Yeah, so here we're midway through the uh, the quest that we're showing um, for you before. Here we're looking at the assault of Bird Castle. Um, so these are big moments that usually uh, sort of culminate at the end of the story. And so here Avar, or Viking Raider, is taking a group of raiders and firds into Bird Castle to go and take down Ruid uh, and his clan. So who exactly is Ruid and why does Eivor sort of want to pick a fight with him? Basically Ruid comes into play about halfway through this story arc where at the beginning of the arc, this is something that, that happens before, Ruid basically caused a lot of turmoil within the territory and Oswald, who's the sort of elderman to be to inherit this territory, needs your help to take him down. Oswald having just been defeated in a previous quest and so here this is revenge but also accomplishing your ultimate goal. So Fizz, as you're talking, we're seeing some of the combat of Valhalla. Can you tell us a little bit about the changes to combat this time around? We wanted to uh, basically add a lot of new mechanics to it. So we added like some dual wielding for the player, like a stun system in there. It, and we really needed to do this to sort of portray that sort of the brutality that comes with being a Viking in the same age. So it sort of fits into that uh, the time uh, and the character. Oswald, he lives. Oswald lives! Eivor, is that you? Shut your ass, twig spine. Here, Eivor has taken her entire army through the assault, and finally it's revealed that our, our elderman, our ally, Oswald, is still alive, and Ruid has him captive. So this is what it comes to, Wolfkist? 
Two Danes fighting over a filthy Saxon whore, son? If this swine is your prize, come and get him. So now that we've seen that Oswald is alive, we have Ruid within our sights. Uh, what's the next step here? So the next move for Eivor is to finally uh, face off against Ruid. She has her allies. They can take care of the rest of the army. Now it's time to go one-on-one -on -one against Ruid in one of our boss battles, actually. Your battle is not won, Oswald. And it's worth pointing out, actually, that here what we're showing is the player... Um, going and facing off against Ruid aggressively, but you, we tend to always have a, to support a 360 degree approach in these things. So the player could have approached this a little bit more stealthy and gotten at least like a good critical hit on either Ruid or his wolf. And so you can play this a little bit more strategically if that's your play style. So we're not only fighting Ruid here, but also his pet wolf, right? You're, one of the, my preferred strategies is to eliminate the wolf first, just focus fire on him. It takes at least one opponent out of the combat. Now, Ruid will have extra abilities that come into play if you do eliminate his wolf, um, but I think having one opponent less in the battlefield makes for a good strategy uh, in the whole. <sighs> Your efforts. Only the cold dark of Niflheim awaits you. Valhalla is my destiny. That thing will not be met today. Why does they should be ruled, Wolfkist? Made thralls, not treated as equals. We are better than this, than all of them. Do not drag me down to the sewage you wallow in. We just had gained my tooth and nail for a second. You throw in with these wastrels, these arrogant swine? Eivor, no! He should be tried before God, a lawful assembly. <laughs> All right, so we've defeated Ruid, we freed Oswald. What comes next? I won't have Oswald, in this case, prefers for Ruid to be kept alive. And so you basically have to choose, are you going to go against his witches or t stay true to your nature? So we have this choice to make, but before we get into that, I want to rewind a little bit because we just did this big grand assault, but Eivor couldn't have done it alone. Uh, she clearly had to recruit some folks along the way, get some troops, get some allies. So let's actually rewind and see how we went about first gathering those troops. Right, so when coming up to an assault, it's a game of numbers. Eivor can go into pretty much any location and be uh, a stealthy Viking, eliminating some of the assets, which ultimately would be a strategy. You can do that, and you'll have some um, some of the ingredients or uh, of the assets there that will have been sabotaged, but you still need an army. So here what we're seeing is Eivor going around the countryside and raising what we call a third, which is the men and the women of the territory who come up and fight in the name of a king. So here Eivor is going around and trying to convince people to fight in the name of Oswald to finally take down the oppressor that is Ruid. Defending East Anglia, defending you. Will you not do the same? What? Die in defense of a last cause? Yeah, so she's really using like the, the image and like the the leadership that Oswald have, what he meant to the people in his name. She's going to recruit these people. Pretty words, Dane. But the men of Theovard have their own battles to fight. So we're told by this Reeve that there are troops, there are allies that he could add to our cause, but first we sort of need to do him a favor, is that right? Yeah, so um, obviously these people have been run down by Ruid and uh, the, the impact he's had on the territory, so I think a lot of these people have sort of lost hope. And so you need to show them that there is hope. And so here Eivor is basically helping them take back one of their, their prized locations um, by taking a couple men and raiding a nearby... Um, Township, basically taking it back for the people and showing that there's there's a reason to continue fighting and then get them on your side.
when Eivor does this, obviously you have access to a full suite of abilities. So again, the improvements that we've done to the fight system. Um, you have some brutal axe throwing in there. You have archery or like a range combat abilities in there as well. Um, so really, again, like depending on what your play style is, you can customize your loadout and go in there um, how you wish. Fizz, we just saw this giant pulse go out. What exactly was that? So that is actually this is what we call the Odin Sight. The Odin Sight is basically our interpretation of the um, the Eagle Vision from previous games, and we thought it was good to sort of bring that back. It's basically Avor's intuition. It's how she perceives the world. When player uses that, you can it'll highlight basically interactive objects like things that will bring her an advantage. So we'll have arrows, cons um, like health consumables that are in there. So it really is like a good way of sort of understanding the world and showing you like things that you can go and touch. Yeah, I mean, speaking of things we can touch, we just picked up this awesome new weapon. It's something we wanted to play with on Assassin's Creed Valhalla, where we have fewer weapons in the game, but you can invest in them more. So they become your weapon. And so depending what your preferred play style is or your preferred weapon type then you can go and choose I'm going to I'm going to fight with this weapon and invest heavily into that. Not only are we looting weapons but we see something here called the book of knowledge. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? They unlock skills for the players. So here you can see the Valkyrie dive that has just been unlocked. We have these spread out throughout the world so again to promote exploration and discovery. As you travel through the world and you explore locations, you can find these books that will add abilities that you can go and invest in, put into your loadout, then go into the different locations with the different uh, quests in the game and use those depending on what your playstyle is. Now we've recaptured this village, we've secured more troops for our assault. Let's jump back now and figure out what we want to do with the Ruid. The rightful king of East Anglia has spared your life today, and so it will be. Compassion is a virtue suited for anyone, Eivor, including you. Thank you. Eivor decided to let him live. Ruid is really angry about that. Being a Norse Viking, being put to the death in battle is your road to Valhalla. So he was basically denied access to Valhalla in this situation. Obviously, all of these decisions come into play later on in the game. So we have very difficult decisions for the player to make. We didn't want to have easy uh, decisions. Yeah, you know, when I was playing, I, I decided to listen to Oswald and spare Ruid's life, but... What exactly is the relationship like between Eivor and Oswald? So the relationship between Eivor and Oswald is is, is an alliance. It's uh, basically Eivor is surrounded by territories um, that initially getting into England are hostile towards her. And um, obviously, if you want to set up a new settlement, you want to have make sure that your neighbor is friendly. Um, so here in East Anglia, Oswald is the man for the job where putting him into a position of power would help her sort of secure her territory. Um, so earlier on to the territory, uh, Eivor comes in here, meets Oswald. The problems he had with Rued are sort of put to light, and going through the arc, you basically help him deal with Rued and and aligning basically Danes with Saxons in one uh, territory. So Fizz, we've completed the assault. We've gotten our hands dirty with some combat, taken down Rued. We have this big open region of East Anglia, so before we head off to Oswald's wedding, what do you say we head out, have some fun, and see what we can get into in the open world? That sounds great. So we see a cat here with a speech bubble above it, and you best believe if you let me talk to a cat, I'm gonna talk to a cat. Yeah, these, these are some of our... Um some of my favorite moments actually in the game where we put in put out a whole bunch of events throughout the territory um, and it sort of rewards again exploration going around it's a it's a chance for us also to sort of showcase a different side of Eivor a lot of the quests sort of deal worth more with like politics and warfare and this shows a slightly more human nature to her uh, so it permit us to explore that character a little bit more And so here, basically, like you're you're trying to help a kid with his cat, and ultimately get that 
cat to sort of join your crew uh, as a cat raider. You just said cat raider way too casually. You're telling me I could have a cat Viking raider on my longship? That's that's exactly what I'm telling you. Oh my god, yes. I love it. Perfect. <laughs> So yeah, as, as you're riding around the, the, the rivers of England, you would see a cat basically walking around your longship, keeping your Viking raiders company. You know, speaking of the Viking longship, we're seeing some of that gameplay here now. Can you talk a little bit about how that works and functions in Valhalla? Yeah, so, so starting out on this project, um, I think the Viking longship is one of the, the biggest images that we all have when we think about Vikings in our game. And so Vikings had this, this awesome design for a longship that had a very shallow hull, so it permitted them to go very far inland very quickly, and you could basically disembark uh, Viking raiders like on pretty much any shore. We added that into the game where you can basically uh, sail up to any location and then just decide to disembark with your guys and raid a location, loot all this treasure, get back in the ship, and then continue really, uh, sailing down the river um, to your next opportunity. So I know past Assassin's Creed games allowed for songs and things like that to be sung on ships. Will Valhalla have a similar version of that? Yeah, so this is something we, we actually wanted the the crew of your ship to become like your, your home away from home. So we added stories and songs into uh, the ship. So basically, as the player is going around, you could decide to have your skull sort of sing a song for you as you row down the river. But you can also decide, depending on who the raiders are in your ship, to hear more about their life. So you can actually queue up stories, and they'll give you a little bit more background on who they are. So you get to know your your sort of fighters as you're traveling around the world, which is a cool um, moment. So here we're seeing a bit of a different view. What exactly are we looking at? We had this on, on previous assassins where you would like ride on on your horse and you could pull out, have the road the the horse sort of follow the track. We have a similar thing for the ship where you can put up your sails. It's cruise control for the ship, so you can pull back, take in the scenery, listen to some songs or some stories, and just take it all in. So, you know, speaking of Viking songs, we have an activity here that's not exactly singing, but kind of related, right? Yeah, so here what we have is what we call flighting, which was an activity that Norse people would partake in. They would like to have a battle of wits and, and sort of poetry, where insults would be thrown back and forth between each other. The idea was to try and have a good insult, um, but also to have a good rhythm and a good rhyme in there. So it, it's basically a precursor to rap battles. Here's the silver. Now begin. To all those whom I speak, they say Eivor's a clod. Then you're speaking to fools and their knowledge is flawed. Well... How exactly do you go about being successful in one of these? The, the trick behind a good flight was to choose the right insult, um, identifying the right cadence, and then trying to find what rhymed the best. I'm known for my might. Interesting. Interesting. Silent whispers all claim that you're terribly dense. Then you've clearly mishurt them. My wit is immense. Oh, you looked out with that one. Well, what a surprise. Eivor of the Raven Clan is a true talent. I'm shocked. Don't believe everything you hear, unless it touches on my flighting. Then heed every word. Take the coin. So now that we've proven our sharp tongue and wit, uh, I think it's time for a bit more relaxing activity. So we're, we're fishing here. Yeah, that's it. Um, so... We gave Eivor a fishing line, so you can actually throw out a line and, and go catch some fish. Um, this is used basically to, uh, uh, to play into our new health loop where the player will lose health in, in the world and it doesn't automatically generate, regenerate like we would have in the past. So you actually have to go out and get some, some supplies. So you'll find mushrooms uh, and some food that you can gather, but here like we, you, you can also catch some fish and consume that to regain some health. If we also so, will sometimes have it in, in certain quests, so it's a good way to sort of chill out on the side of the, uh, of the water and just, again, take it all in.
So this is what we call one of our offering altars. So the idea is that you, you find these around the world and you make offerings to it. So it'll take like animal parts and stuff that you can find throughout the world. Here, what you're seeing though, is sort of like a, a fancy version of it where as you do your offering, you get interrupted by some, some kids that basically come and steal your stuff. So it was just a way for us to sort of showcase that, like the some systems and the activities in the world can sort of play in with some, some quests and some little events. So it's our way to sort of dress up these moments and make it all fit inside the, the whole experience. Yeah, this seemed like a really sort of unexpected turn for what I thought was going to be is kind of a simple interaction. Yeah, and it's really what we were trying to do with these events is to is to give another dimension to Eivor, other than just, you know, the pure rar Viking or the politician. Because you can imagine at some point that will we'll grow old if you're always telling that 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 version of the character. So it, it lets us really go into the depth of who is Avar, uh, what motivates her, how she can interact with the world outside of uh, warfare and politics. And it also showcases like a, a different facet of the world at the same time. It's not only Avar, so it, it just winds the breadth of the stories that we can tell. So who exactly are these two children? These are kids of East Anglia. They are going through tough times um, with whatever Ruid's been doing to the territory. And so they're just here trying to survive and, and basically exploit the people that are there to make offerings. It was kind of nice to see that Eivor wasn't really necessarily upset at them for stealing, and you know, after you talk to them, you have the choice of helping them. You can, you know, give them food, give them some money, um, or you know, maybe just say, "Hey, good luck, on your way." Yeah, and then this is something we also wanted to do a lot. Like, so here we're doing an event, we do it in quest as well, but we want to do, we want to give a lot of this agency into players' hands so that they can sort of shape Eivor a little bit. Um, uh, who she is, so it represents them a little bit more, and they can role play that a little bit uh, better. And again, it just gives her like a little bit more humanity in these in these moments. Provide for small walkers. Here, large walker. A necklace. Yes, it's a Saint Martin seal. You're welcome here anytime, large walker. You're one of us now. Visit us, okay? I will. Take care now, small green walkers. So I think AC veterans might recognize this here, but uh, what exactly is Eivor chasing down? Yeah, so here you're seeing Eivor um, running down one of our tattoo uh, images. So this is challenging the player on free run abilities but also for fans of the series sort of pulling at their heartstrings for some beloved features. <laughs> so are we going to be able to tattoo Eivor? Yes. By collecting these tattoos, you actually bring them to, back to your settlement and then you can customize different body parts, having different tattoos everywhere. So again, another form of expression and it's sort of to represent that, Vulcan, that Viking culture. Fizz, one of my favorite things when I was just out there exploring East Anglia was coming upon a house or a building and realizing that there was a chest inside, but that there was no easy way in. And in this case, I saw all the doors were barred, but I knew that because there was a chest in there, there must have been some way to get inside. Uh, so I went around the back and, you know, found a way in. Yeah, I'm glad you actually caught on to that. You're pointing at something that we wanted to work on a lot on Valhalla, where we wanted the exploration to make you feel smarter. So we, we played a lot with puzzle solving. So making sure that every house that you find sort of appeals to you, like it draws your attention. And then when you want to come and explore, it's not it's not given to you. You still have to work for a little bit. So it'll challenge you on your observation skills, um, logic, just trying to find how do I get into this? So we play a lot with uh, level design, quest design to offer challenges to players. And you basically come out of it like with a better feeling for the exploration but you also get to see more of a story behind any of these locations which we've crafted so it, it gave us a little bit more time to sort of slow down the experience and and tell a different version of a story a poor victim of someone's fury 
Yeah, I mean, speaking about exploration and just finding things out in the world, I was just wandering and came across this clearing and found this kind of morbid altar. Yeah, so this is this is one of our bigger events that we we have um, scattered in the world. So as Eivor explores, um, she can find um, altars like this, and by interacting with them here, it's a trap that's been set um, for by by this character named Regan. Um, now there's a bigger story behind all this. It, it, there's multiple steps to it later on. Um, so this this is one of the moments. Uh, it, it, it permits us to go into a slightly more mystical realm and play with a boss fight that has more magical abilities, if we will, and and basically have this awesome boss fight in the middle of the swamps. And so here, the abilities that you see uh, Reagan using, like, are a little bit on the mystical side of things. What's happening is Eivor at the beginning of that trap is poison, and so she starts sort of hallucinating, seeing the world in a sort of different uh, light and filter. Um, and so that that's sort of what lets us go into this this the the realm of the weird. My rage, spirit of my father's rage, fill me. So we just saw here that Regan belongs to something called the Daughters of Lyria. Yeah, that's correct. By finding the other daughters, you'll get a little bit more backstory on who they are, so we don't want to spoil that too much. But it creates like a, a sort of greater story that is not on the main path in any way, but it, it's still very rich and adds to the lore of this world and actually plays into history. So we just had a really exciting, really intense boss battle. I think it's time for something a little bit more relaxing and calming now. Yeah, it's all, here it's all about pacing yourself with the highs and the lows. So here we have a low chill moment of what we call building a cairn. So Eivor, as she explores the world, will find these sort of meditative areas where you have a, a pile of rocks that you could just stack on one uh, on top of another using physics. And I mean, yeah, the, the ultimate goal is to try and get the highest pile of rocks, but really it's about taking in the sights, um, relaxing, taking a step back and, and build, just building something. Together we stack stones into cairns. These? Yes. Think of this as a test of mind and wit. Stack the cairn stones high and wide into any shape you like. I mean, you can spend as much time as you want building these things, making them as high as you want, as weird as you want. I'm sure, like, a lot of these stuff will end up on the internet, like people comparing structures. And the cool thing is that once you've built it and you decide to get out of it, it sort of stays there. And so that's yours, right? And until the moment where you come back and you want to build a new one, it's, it's sort of cool that we were able to, to give that to players to express themselves. At this point in the demo, we've explored East Anglia, we've met some children, we've broken into a house, we fought a boss, we built a Karen. I think now it's finally time to go and head off to Oswald's wedding. Yeah, so this is the, this is the moment it's all been building up to. Um, by the moment you get into the territories, territory, sort of like mentioned by Oswald, that he's trying to uh, get married with his Dane lady. And so as you go through the arc, um, that's sort of like the underlying thread. Really, it's about Ruid creating turmoil in the uh, territory and helping Oswald sort of um, get above that and, and show that he's a good leader. And so you finally, after going through all of that arc, uh, finally get these two together, go through their their, we their wedding, and you're invited to attend the ceremony. Um, and then all the uh, activities and fun times that comes afterwards. Yeah, as much as we've seen the brutal side of England, we it's nice to see you know the joyous side of it as well. Yeah, and it's something we really wanted to, to play on in, in Valhalla, where being a Viking is not only about being a raider or a warrior, 
I mean, there's revelry, there's feasting, there's partying that goes, and like, if, if someone knows how to party, it's a Viking. And so here, this is one of our opportunities to sort of show that, to show what a, a sort of Viking gathering is. And what's cool here is it's a, it's a good alliance of Norse culture with Saxon culture, sort of smashing those th- two things together um, and building bridges. Yeah, I mean, what's a wedding without some drunk archery, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, so like, anything can happen in a in a Viking event, right? Eivor, yeah, here, here, just get drunk, some sh- shoot some arrows. Ah, oh, barely a challenge. Steady all, and ready yourself for the wedding race. The king and his bride against all. My king. He. <laughs> So here we see the decision I made to spare Ruid came back to bite us. Yep, that, that's the decision you made uh, coming back. Um, so uh, as we said before, all of your decisions have consequences, and this is a big one. I challenge you. I accept you're basically presented with the option to sort of step in for Oswald, Oswald fight the fight for him, or let him go and fight his I own fight. fight yeah, you know, personally, I chose to me. fight myself because I, I thought Eivor is the type of person who likes to finish what she started. Plank by plank, and a dead king cannot keep his oaths. Let me finish this. Oswald, you gutless alias swine! I'll slay the wolf kissed, then hang you with your own tongue. How does this encounter with Ruid differ from our previous fight with him? Uh, so at this point, you've eliminated his wolf, so it's just him. And so he he's angry at this point, and so he will start using his his big gun abilities like fairly earlier on in the fight. Um, so it's way more vicious, way faster. Um, there's less strategy. He goes literally swords blazing at you. Um, and so th- this is a fight to the death. And of course here, like, this is a decision you made to go and fight him, but there's multiple outcomes to this scenario. You could have let uh, Oswald fight his own fight um, and prove basically his station as, as the rightful leader. Um, if you had eliminated Ruid, obviously this would not have happened. It would have been a slightly more joyous occasion. Um, but ultimately, in all scenarios, you still have an alliance with Oswald. He's proven to be um, the right leader for this territory um, and to be a good ally for you. I promised you an alliance, and now you have it. And one day I will need you to make good on that alliance. So we're about to take off from the wedding, but Eivor decides it's a good idea to check up on her friend Finner. Yeah, so Finner, Finner is probably one of the more recurring characters in, in this arc. You get to meet him very on. He's a very endearing character, um, sort of used to have a Viking life, sort of misses it, and going through all these adventures together is sort of like... A, lights that fire back and so he's he's willing to join you in your raiders um so he's one of many raiders that you'll you'll encounter in the game and you can sort of recruit bring back home and then have them sort of join you on your adventures on the on long ship he can tell you these stories that we're telling you about you get a little to know a little bit more about him um so again it's a fun way to sort of discover more about these characters that you meet and bring him along for adventures together together I'll gather my things. Well, folks, we've come to the end of our Assassin's Creed Valhalla playthrough. Fizz, thank you so much for joining us. When and where can people play it? Assassin's Creed Valhalla will be out on Xbox Series X and PlayStation 5 and is coming to Xbox One, PlayStation 4, PC, and Stadia on November 17th.
everybody, thanks for joining us. My name is Eric Pope. I'm the senior community developer on Hyperscape. And I'm Graham Jennings. I'm the senior producer on Hyperscape. Hyperscape is now in its open beta phase, so you can go to Uplay and download it directly. So a little while back, we recorded a match for you so we could walk through it moment to moment, explain what's going on throughout a match of Hyperscape. There's a lot going on with hacks, guns, the gameplay. So Graham and I are going to walk you through it right now, and I hope you'll enjoy. So to start now, you'll see the insertion phase. Uh, there's the three of them in the squad, so they're trying to decide on where they want to go. It looks like Helios, which is one of the landmarks, is going to be one of the choices. So all the places we're seeing on the map right now with like a name above it, that tends to be a higher loot area, would you say? For one of the, the big yellow letter ones, like this one, this is one of the landmarks. Landmarks tend to have a higher density and higher quality loot overall. Which also means most people will be going there, so you might have usually have a few more friends uh, if you go to a landmark. <laughs> so in this case though, he's gone outside and he's found a supply crate. So he's starting to loot these instead, so he's looking for both hacks and weapons. Right, so the looting phase, uh, many folks will be familiar with, but in Hyperscape, you do have those supply crates that you're, you may be lucky enough to find. And what's the, deal, what's the deal with supply crates? So supply crates are placed around the world, so you'll hear them and then you can go and find them. And then inside them, you'll find uh, weapons and hacks. Usually, uh, you find slightly better weapons and hacks within them. Here now, we've switched, so we're looking at Chimera instead. Uh, so he's in the landmark, he's in Helios now, and he's still in the looting phase. But as you can see from the red triangle up there, there's actually some friends, or not friends, in there with him just now. Yeah, so the action gets uh, started, okay, right here. Yeah, so he's one-on-one, -on -one. he's going with the Mammoth Shotgun uh, against someone who's using the heal hack at the minute, which is the, the red circle you can see. So that player's taking extra health at that point which looks like it helped him uh, hold his ground against that mammoth. And I believe it helped him survive at that point. There seems to be a few other players in here just now, so the combat started and then Elimination's got his first kill. Oh no, so uh, he's just been eliminated actually. Yes. Yeah. So, so he just, uh, he's been eliminated and he's turned into an echo now. So he's gonna wait for his friends um, to bring him back. So he's gonna go to one of these restore points, which are basically places where someone else from another squad has been eliminated. And you can be restored and brought back to life at one of those points. So the action pretty much never stops in the game. If, you, if you're eliminated, you're not out. You're not stuck watching a camera uh, with someone else. You, you're still playing, you can inform your squad as to what's going on, and then you can call to be restored at one of those points. There's plenty of people, like you said, who ended up at Helios at the end. There's at yeah. least three <laughs> other squads. So we can also see when you have a teammate who needs a revive, it's called out on your... Uh... Yeah, the green icon you can see at the side is him uh, calling for a revive at this point. So Mr. Gomi's busy uh, eliminating other players, uh, which will cause more revive points to appear as well. This guy's low on health, so I don't think he's gonna last long for that. Okay, so I see once someone's eliminated, they drop a revive point that you can use. What you'll actually see at the minute now is both Chimera and Elimination are both Echoes, so it's just Mr. Gomi by himself at present time. So can he survive this and get on. <laughs> oh, He's going again. There's still, there's still a few other players in here, that's for sure. So that was the slam hack he used there. So basically he projected himself up in the air. He landed, he dealt some damage, and he's managed to eliminate yeah, the other player. Yeah, he got the elimination with it, which is pretty good. And then he's starting to bring back uh, Chimera at this point. So he's now back into the game. Right. So he's got to reloot and find new weapons again, because when you are eliminated, you go back to just your melee weapon. Okay, so you don't hold on to your gear when you, when you get eliminated. No. So this is the start of the decay you can see. So you see all these blue triangles that are appearing. This is how we basically do, you know, map size uh, reduction and zone reduction to bring players towards a smaller map into the center. So instead of having a, you know, a circle that shrinks, we've decided to actually dissolve the map. And is it kind of the same? Will you always know which which uh, districts are decaying first? You can see from the uh, from the map when you bring it up what's going, and you'll also see the icon when he turns on the left hand side of the screen a second ago, which shows you where the safe area to go is. So at the top, it will show you sector is closing, and then you've got the little icon of the person running with a distance against it that tells you where to go to the next safe place. So I see Mr. Gummy has pinged that spot to sort of regroup outside of the uh, landmark. They're going to take some uh, height as well to start to be able to look for other players and to keep themselves a little bit safe. So he's seen another player, so he's starting to throw salvos at him and probably the guy breaks up too. Yeah. You see the red uh, exclamation mark? That's basically his teammates pinging and saying, hey, there's an enemy over here. 
and he's been shot out from behind. So there's def definitely players around. You'll see him going to go high again to try and take some positional advantage um, to get up because he knows he knows there's another team on the roof up there. He doesn't want to be below them, especially not with his salvo grenade going. Well, what I'm noticing is that they're doing a good job of switching from street level to the, the, the rooftops. Is that kind of a good way to approach a, a game of Hyperscape, to not just stay in one area? You should really use the variety between streets, interiors, and rooftops for navigation and to keep yourself safe. Rooftops are great to see what's going on, but you're also then a target for the snipe. So you really need to adjust uh, height uh, and interior and exterior as you go, just to keep yourself safe. And to aggressively loot too to find the best stuff. So he just picked up a golden skybreaker. What is the gold mean? That is the top tier of skybreaker. So basically, you can have a level five skybreaker, which is what he just picked up. We will fusion weapons together. So if you have a skybreaker and you find another skybreaker, it will go to level two. Find another one, it will go to level three. And what he has now, as you can see in the bottom uh, bar there with the yellow, he has the top tier of the skybreaker. So this does more damage. So you, each time you fusion something, a weapon or a hat, it will go up in various different um, abilities. So you're basically, just, just to loot up, to fuse up, you just need to find a duplicate of your weapon or hack, and that's all. Yeah. So you'll see though, on the left, uh, when you see the other players' names, you can see that uh, Mr. Gomi has two uh, yellow weapons and a yellow hack. So he has two fully fused weapons and one fully fused hack. And how does healing work? Will so healing will either work by I took damage and then I retreated and your health bar will come back up. Or if a player has a heal hack, which he actually does at present time, so you see that in the bottom it says heal, he can throw that on the ground and then there'll be an AOE of heal so both you and your teammates can come into it and it will heal you. And enemies cannot heal up in that same AOE? They can't heal up in your AOE, but they could also use the heal hack themselves if they wish. Cool. So you see them now, they're starting to hunt again. I guess they've heard some other players because you can see them starting to move around and there's a, there's a sense that they're not alone at this point. And there's a ping for an enemy, so yeah, the combat started again. So this guy finds himself in the middle uh, of a bunch of, uh, of the three players, so he's oh. not in the best spot just now. Oh, good and yeah, that's the end of it. <laughs> So if you manage to fusion uh, one of his hacks then again. So here you'll see the decay started. The player found himself out in the decay as it was starting. He had no cover left. So you find yourself out in the open and the, uh, the eliminated him with a record at that point. And another one down for elimination. He seems to be uh, on a roll at this point. And now he's fully fused his sniper rifle, the protocol V. Still quick check, just make sure there's no one else coming in. And you don't want to have someone behind you at the last minute. Five so there's still five teams left. Uh, and then we swap back to Mr. Gomi, who's still uh, rolling with the Skybreaker at this point. It's worked out well for him. Yeah. The case starting to happen in this region too, so it's starting to move forward a little bit. They have a nice variety of weapons between them. You know, there's the, someone's got a salvo, there's a skybreaker, there's a ripper. They really split in terms of hacks and weapons, so they have a nice diverse uh, selection in terms of game style. So you see him go up high now, he's probably going to use a skybreaker. And he has, and that's the end for uh, Takeshi uh, Casually. Takeshi Casually, so now you mentioned that username. You'll notice if you've been watching the, the feed, uh, the usernames all seem pretty similar in this match. What's, what's the story with that? So this is the feature we call streamer protection. So uh, it allows you to anonymize who's in the game. So this is basically what you can see now. This poor player has managed to find themselves in the corner and tried to hide. Unfortunately, they've been chased in there by someone with a, a fully fused salvo. So uh, that, that was kind of the end for them. Dangerous. So they've swapped now and they've gone to uh, the Mammoth and stuff. So they've swapped out to the shotgun. So it's quick to change your playstyle. You can easily find another weapon you like and you can adjust based on map size, how many players are left and continuously adjust. And that countdown that just finished was a health kit event. What, what does that mean? What are these events? That so are basically in the top right now, you'll see the cross and it's kind of ticking down. So this has said that this is the time left for the health kit event. Basically, every match, uh, there will be cards played, which change what happens in the match. So this was the health kit event. There's things like low gravity 2, which projects up in the air and you can jump over. 
And are these just random, or are, are players triggering these events somehow? So there's two different ways this happens. So there's a Game Master, Grace, who plays them in, in this case. Or if there's a streamer in the game, the streamer's viewers will get the chance to vote for which one they want to see. So it'll pop up, there'll be three different options. And then whichever gets the highest number of votes will be the one that's played in the game. So viewers are directly impacting uh, the streamers. And that's through the, the Crowncast extension? Through the Crowncast uh, Twitch extension. Cool. So here uh, you see that, that you got caught in the decay then and fell through the building. So trying to move back in. There's, there's only three teams left now. So we're starting to get towards a smaller map size. So it's going to become uh, chaotic shortly. And they're just on the edge of this landmark. Of Red Tiger, so they're heading up. Here you'll see at the top it says crown appears in 10 seconds. So basically, we have a crown that spawns in the wall. If a player grabs the crown and manages to hold on to it for 45 seconds, you will win that game through what we call crown victory. The only downside to that is once you've picked up the crown, everyone can see where you are and everyone's gonna chip. So yeah, he's got the crown, the countdown is on. As soon as if he were to get eliminated, it would drop and that we're countdown would go away. Right? Yes, and then whoever picks it up next, with that person, uh, the countdown will start again for them. And that's only one of the two ways you can win a match of Hyperscape, right? Yeah, you can win via the crown if you want to take it and maneuver. This is why you'll see the really high up uh, to own, own the higher space. Or you can eliminate all the other teams. You could sneak around and, and grab that crown and survive. Left to stop the crown if you use your hacks well and you use your movement and uh, hide a lot, then yeah, you could possibly grab the crown, get to the end, and then win via a crown victory. Wow. There it is. A screen I'll never see. <laughs> All right, well, that was just one match of the frenetic, fast-paced game, Hyperscape, that we are both very lucky to work on. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for watching UB Forward in this post-show. As we mentioned before, the game's available right now in open beta on PC. Just go to Uplay to download it. And we're also thrilled to be taking part in the Twitch Rivals event with the information appearing magically on the screen below us. So, Graham, thank you for your time. Thank you, Eric. Have a good day. And we'll see you in the Hyperscape.